Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of Move Crush Count. I'm your host, Scott Joseph. Today's episode is brought to you by JL Marketing, the digital and direct marketing agency that helps you outsmart your toughest competitors so you don't have to outspend them. With their innovative approach, JL Marketing helps you move the crowd, crush the competition, and count the money. Make sure you visit their website at jnlmarketing.com so you can see how they will help you outsmart your toughest competitors. So let's get started with introducing today's guest, John Traver. He is the CEO of Traver Companies, which include Traver Connect, XPS Solutions, Third Day Ranch. He's got tons of experience driving business growth. He is a true mastermind when it comes to identifying or overcoming the biggest challenges that stand in the way of success. So in this episode, we're going to discuss different insights and strategies that drive real business growth, including the, me- the most effective problem-solving processes and techniques that we can use to speed up growth. So it doesn't matter if you're a seasoned business leader, maybe you're just starting out. Uh, John's expertise, in my opinion, is invaluable. Uh, you're going to take away actionable advice that you can help take your business to the next level. You know, I, I, John was a guest on Move Crush Count. That's how we met a few years ago. I consider him a great friend. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to introduce him now. Welcome back to Move Crush Count, John Traver. Scott, my friend, thank you for inviting us. And you know how I love spending time with you. Um, and I got to tell anybody that's joining us today, this guy is is impressive. What he's done in the industry through JNL. And now he has the passion with Move Crush Count. He's got the Business Bourbon and Cigars event. He is passionate about teaching, growing, innovating. Um, He oozes this stuff. So the guys that he's running with, the gals that he's running with are people that are also passionate about it. So I'm honored to be here with you, buddy. Thanks for having us. Well, you know, like-minded people, right? I know you're an innovative guy. You and I have had several interviews. and today we're going to talk a lot more about problem solving, I think, but gear it in a way that drives growth. So I, I love that. Uh, we're going to mix up the questions a little bit differently. And I've done this a couple for the last couple episodes where a lot of what we're going to do is familiar to you because you participate in the Business Bourbon and Cigar Mastermind mm-hmm. uh, breakout sessions. Mm-hmm. And we're going to ask a lot of similar questions so we can kind of root cause what's keeping us from growing more importantly, really narrow in and focus on finding solutions to those specific problems. So you okay if we dive right in? Yeah, for sure. I'm going to follow your lead, buddy. <laughs> what inspired you to become an entrepreneur? What, what, when you first started, what happened there? What, what, not everybody's cut out for it. You are. Why? Huh. Well, from my perspective, I, don't, I may be hallucinating, right? Um, <laughs> I look back and and I see an early desire. I see an interest. I think that that was stirred up through my parents or my mom and dad. Uh, a lawnmower repair business, uh, working for myself in early life farming. You know, using the tractor, doing driveways. You know, whatever. Um, yep. So that that's kind of like the early early seeds. But but I I need to tell the rest of the story because. I started a company after being in the car business for a number of years and I had done well and, and, you know, accomplished a few things in automotive. And I start this company and I'll be honest with you, that was a grind. I think every dollar I brought in, I spent, you know, and I had one client who was a big dealer group in Wisconsin that called me and ultimately asked me to be director of corporate training was my initial role. And uh, that was a save for me. You know, it was like, okay, good. Um, Did that. And that's really where some of my ideas for updating an outdated sales process, the BDC, that's where those began to kind of come in. So I took a, a training company background with time in the business and that and it, you know, but then what I had to do is overcome fear because I, Scott, I was, uh, I got crushed, you know, I did, I got crushed that first attempt. And so, you know, it was like, okay, dude, do you know what you're doing? And I remember starting Traver Technologies in Houston, Dawn and I, we moved to Houston and I, I remember walking in those little offices, 1,042 square feet, and I could like see myself on the movie screen and I'm literally like saying, stop, you know, because I'm walking into my own nightmare, like, what are you doing? And the first, 
mm, half a year there was brutal. It was brutal. Um, and I literally asked myself, what did you do? But I stayed the course. I believed in what I was doing around BDC. The phone rang, Tony Fujita, Toyota Motor Sales. In fact, I saw Mr. Toyota just passed. Did you see that this past yeah. week? 87 years yeah. old. Um, he was at the helm back then. Uh, incredible man. But Tony Fujita called VP of merchandising uh, for North America. And he had seen what we were doing in like eight or 10 of the top 25 Toyota stores. And he basically said, hey, I'm, you know, we're kind of interested in what you're doing. And that led to a relationship. And it eventually led to me speaking and doing work with Toyota and um, and the company grew. So, you know, it's interesting, Scott. I I uh, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make a contribution. Um, I didn't necessarily have visions of grandeur. I knew I didn't want to be a prisoner to the business I was in. I knew that. Does that make sense to you? You know, it does. Because your background is kind of cool with your dad. And and like, I don't know if you want to share any of that, but that I feel like we're sort of in parallel there in how we made the decision to do what we're doing. Well, we both started our companies, at least in the auto space, uh, that vertical at the same time. Yep. I It's hard to believe we had not met prior to us doing this show a few years ago. I know. Remember, you and I have talked Shocking. about that. Yeah, you and I have talked about that. There's there are people that I've seen from afar, and you know, I was so glad you reached out when you did. And of course, we've become fast friends since and and yeah. uh just look forward to the years ahead together. You know, you're famous for saying something that I think uh goes well with the the theme of this show. You know, and and I think you may have said it during one of the mastermind sessions. Maybe it was to Sandy uh, Cerami or somebody else where I think you were quoted as saying the difference between a lot of what I do and others is I stay with the problem long enough. I'm not probably saying it exactly the way you say it, but what do you mean by that? So that's an Einstein quote. What he said was, he said, it's not that I'm smarter. I just stay with the question longer. That's it. Yes. The mm -hmm. question. And yeah. I, I'm putting up, by the way, I'm putting up uh I'm putting up uh, Michael Poro's comment where he loves to correct me on here. I love him. These hey, Mike. Got their, their opportunities, not problems, just saying. And so this is coming through. He's coming through on LinkedIn. So we're streaming live on YouTube, awesome. LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and Twitter. So fire away questions if you've got them. Yeah. Uh, and we'll try to get to them on air. If not, we can go back. We'll go back and, and John and I will definitely answer any questions you might have. But there are problems until we turn them into opportunities. And that's what we're going to do today. So <laughs> I love it. You, you got to turn it. them into the opportunity. Hey, um, I, on that, there's an old um, acrostic that I learned from a guy years ago, and that's called GPO, Goals, Problems, Opportunities. And check this out. If you and I have a room of 100 people, like we will here in about two weeks, right? Yep. In, in yep. San Antonio at BBNC, Business Bourbon Cigars, another one of Scott's creations. Um, <clears throat> goals, about five, uh, about, let's see, 15% of the room is goal minded. So like in the car business, there's a lot of management by objective. So there's a lot yeah. of those people in the room, but it's about 15%. 80% yeah. of the room is, um, they're, they're problem solvers and 5% of the room are opportunity seekers. So like Scott, you're very much an opportunity seeker. You, yes. you just, you look at it that way. Uh, you have that. It's, and I like to think that opportunity seekers are, they're looking for the play that changes the game. That one Correct. play that just, and, and you can see how quick Scott responds. That's home yeah. for him. That's how he's built. So in any environment, when you start, like what Mike Poro just said, that's how Mike sees the world. And he's yeah. right. And you see how yeah. Scott's going, well, it's a problem until... See, Scott's looking for the opportunity. So I just I, I just had to throw that in there because I love to hear. And that old GPO, if you guys can remember that, is so helpful because when you have somebody in front of you that speaks a different language than you, just shift gears. Begin to see it the way. And you'll find that you can sort of not only build a rapport, but begin to see something maybe in a new way. And that, to me, Scott, is where innovation happens easier for most people. When you begin to see it in a new language. Make sense? 
It does. And what's great about this whole topic that we're bringing up right now is it leads me to my next question that I, I had written down. Uh, and this was not planned, so, but it's a beautiful segue. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so I, love, wonderful. I love it. So what methods do you use to identify new business opportunities and what criteria uh, do you use to evaluate those opportunities? All right. Well, OK, gut level. Here's what I tend to do but it's your decision. Okay. So just because this is what I'm doing doesn't mean this works for our audience. But um, I, I think kind of, if you listen to what you and I just talked about, you can't do anything in life without um, powering it with a question. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. So, so if you and I are walking in the hallway, approaching each other, before I say hello to you, I literally have to ask myself, should I say anything? What should I say? Like that is all going on in your brain. Learned this years ago. Um, and when you think about that, you kind of think about your state and your, your mental outlook on life. Like Mike Poro, if you're still listening, you're a master at this. And I know you're a master at it because of how you talk and the energy you bring to how you, you're managing your questions. Um, so the questions you ask, I think, are the key to identifying new opportunities, Scott. You know, it's like the more profound the question, um, right. you know, the better the answer. So here, if you, if you say, why me, you know, you may be surprised. Sometimes you're going to say, well, you deserve it. You old slouch. You know what I mean? Uh, you can lie to yourself. Um, but if I were to give you a few examples, um, you know, okay, I'll give you a handful. Um, start by asking this about your business. What is our potential? Start there. Yeah. Say, yeah. what's our potential? What's our potential? in this space, what's our potential nationally? What's our potential? Is there a global potential for what we're doing? How, how do we multiply this nationally in say the next 36 months? How do we multiply it by three, by five, by 10, by 20? Those are very specific questions. Um, you know, maybe like, like here for me at Traver Companies, I have three completely different businesses, different leadership teams, and so we challenge ourselves with unique questions, but they apply to each business. So I'll give you an example. Let's start way outside our normal uh, comfort level, uh, if I can do this. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, the ranch. Okay, the ranch. You know, we, we picture straw in our mouth and, you know, we're snapping suspenders, but that's not it at all. There's, okay, so what are we doing? We're, we're answering this question. How can we contribute most meaningfully to the protein cycle with ranching. How do we contribute to the protein cycle? So you can do that with beef, but you can also do that with forage because beef needs forage. So we started with beef and through that journey, we discovered forage was a necessary, it was a kind of the card that had to be played before the cattle. And well, we learned a lot about what was in that line and, and how we could go much farther with that, we could contribute in a greater way. And so today, you know, we, we have multiple locations, trucking line, and we provide forage through retail stores across the Southeast region or South Central region here um, in a large way. And so, so that question kind of drove us or XPS Solutions, um, you know, I bought that company in 2004, Scott, when I was going to, so I sold in 2000, it was November, 2000 to ADP, Traver Technologies, the BDC, the original BDC work. And I, I had a three-year variable comp piece, right? And so I thought, well, I better start looking for something. And when I bought that company, I thought I was leaving ADP. They came back and said, Hey, we want you to, you know, be involved in these other divisions. Uh, it was automotive service consulting, Mike Nichols, Inc., Profit Point. Uh, 20 group moderator stuff. And I was like, gosh, I, I thought you guys wanted me to leave. No, we didn't want you to leave. I don't know why you think that. So now I'm like, I have this company. So that company was very small. It was in self-storage and commercial real estate. But I saw that industry growing. Like I saw America as a pack rat, right? And what I saw in that business is still a similar question we asked today. And it was, how do we create a best in class counter experience virtually in commercial real estate and self-storage? So like we have a mobile app for tenants today. We process millions of dollars of payments. We do gate code move. We do actual rentals and move-ins, live AI. So all that comes from that one question. Did it all happen the first year? No, but that question guided us. And then TCON, Traver Connect, um, you know, the question is literally how do we positively impact customer experience 
in the drive, create profitable revenue for fixed ops, and give our dealers a direct advantage, a substantial advantage, whether it's cost reduction, increase in UIO absorption, you know, absorption or UIO retention or all the above, that really drives our thinking. So I think, Scott, in business, um, a lot of people, okay, there's a small amount of people that can can look for the play that changes the game and find them. You're one of those guys. And I, I'm not saying that because we're public, but I'm saying it because it's true. Like I've watched you do yeah. it. But let me let me just tip that up for a second. There are some people that, and I'm going to go somewhere with this, okay? There are some people that think that way all the time, you know, and they're what I, you know, they're, they're trying to get in and get out. And you see it in this space. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yep. You know, where they just, okay. So here's the thing. Um, to me, I think real value is created and built over time. And if you ask anyone who's achieved that, uh, you know, literally you're talking about significance. I think the longer the results last, the more significant that activity feels to you and me like J and L tell me J and L doesn't feel good to you watching what Jamil is doing with your team. Yes. Oh, I'm, there's a lot of momentum right now and Listen, you can, you can always do his tone change when he says that. That's, like he goes, that's what I'm talking about. But yeah. Scott, you could have probably sold that company 20 times. True or yeah. false? Yeah. Well, if I was smart, if I was smart, if I could go back in time, all right, when we made the switch and started pivoting to digital in 2011, yeah. at that time, the direct mail, the email, the landing page stuff, the stuff we were working with on the OEMs, I should have sold that. It was it was high. Yeah. I should have sold that yeah. and then just started another digital agency because yeah. then I would have been able to have two assets instead of the one um, because we've watched direct mail obviously decline, right? And thank God we made the pivot uh, when we did. But a smarter business person would have, I did ask the right questions back then. I can hey, tell you that. You know who did that <laughs> and did it well? And I'm going to finish this thought on yeah. the opportunity, you know, to play the changes of the game versus, you know, these questions. But you know who did that? You remember Carl Westcott? Who was Carl Westcott? ASTN. Remember ASTN? Automotive Satellite Television Network. In the 90s, it was hot and they were here in Dallas. You remember it now? Yes, a little bit. They were in thousands of dealerships. George Stavros, who worked with us at yep, Traver yep. Tech for years, had been there for years. But Carl Westcott sold like in mm, 2000. Think about that. And then what happened next? Al Gore created the internet, right? And yep. so had to, sorry. Um, that's kind of funny. <laughs> And, uh, and, and of course everything went digital and you didn't need satellites and television feeds. He had law enforcement television network, automotive satellite television network. I spoke there like they would fly me up on Mondays for years, Joe Lascota, Vicki Hudson. And, and I, I mean, like in the cabinet here, I have tons of shows that we got to do. Um, but that model went dead and he sold it at just the right time. And it was hundreds of millions, Scott. Yeah. I mean, it was a huge deal. But the reason I'm bringing this up, does Warren Buffett trade stocks? No, he doesn't trade stocks. He right. invests in companies. Correct. You see my point? So, yep. and I'm not trying to say this is right or wrong if you're in and out of the space or you're making moves. What I'm saying is the question was asked to me, like, how do I look at this? So I typically look for business trends, Scott, that have some runway and I look for gaps that I believe we can impact. Um, and, and so, you know, when I do that, when I'm looking at the business, I, I cannot do that without thinking about the people in the business. And so yep. I always have a handful of things I'm asking around this whole theme of questions. I'm asking people too. like my favorite question when I call any of our leaders is, hey, and not only how's it going, uh, you know, how you doing one to ten? But the next, because that's personal, that's one of the five I'll always ask. But here's what I'll say. I'll say, hey, Scott, what do you need from me? And that always is around decisions. And it's my way of showing them, look, I'm working for you too. Like this is, 
you know, and it allows them to stay in sort of a lane where they know I'm going to ask that question. What do you need from me? What do I need to go chase? What do I need to do? Um, what do you need my help on? That's kind of around problems. Um, what's going on that we haven't talked about? That's kind of like emerging plans. I love that with Bob Gower. Um, yeah. Or I'll say, what's cooking that I should know about? That's either around yeah. progress. Um, usually, hey, well, we have this deal and it's with so-and-so and it looks like we're going to need this. And uh, but but I mean, look for that to hit. Hey, that's great. You know, yeah. so so they they want to be able to answer those questions with stories. But so to me, those are those are a handful, Scott, that I'm asking all the time. And then that's kind of the psychology to answer your question around. To me, it's about significance. It's it, as long as I possibly can. And when I measure significance, I need to be transparent with everybody here and say there is nothing that I'm doing that is going to last forever. So to me, eternity is longer than anything I can do. So the challenge for me is how long can I make this impact blank automotive? So to see the BDC still going today through some of its bumpy stages, or I have a conversation with a dealer at BB&C, which happened, and this dealer's perception of what the BDC was, wasn't even close to what, what I saw it as. And yeah. this dealer was kind of poking holes in it. And I thought... That no, I didn't argue. I I just listened to him. I just tried to see it through his eyes in this particular conversation, but it was an eroded view, Scott. Yeah, you know. So so uh, anyway, how's that? Well, I I I love it. I and the key I, there's such a big difference between setting a goal and asking a question. And to me, the question is so much more powerful because you can't just sit there and say, "All right, how are we gonna?" increase sales five times over the next three years, you got to go in your head and or with your team and you got to answer the question. You got to come up with real answers on how to do it. It doesn't matter how big the goal is. There's always an answer All right. yeah. it, because it might require that you buy, you know, a different company. It might require, you're not, you're not, it's not about what's realistic with our situation right now. It's not how can I increase sales uh, in the next three years five times with what I'm doing right now. No, it's about how can I increase sales five times in the next 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, three years, whatever. And if that's impossible to do in the current situation, then you have to find an answer that goes outside what you're currently doing. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get real breakthroughs. So uh, to me... I, you know, you you nailed me. I am an opportunity guy. I wanted these mastermind stuff that we do to be all about breakthroughs because for me, breakthroughs are what make people wealthy. Yes. No, I see it. To me, wealth is created over time. Uh, yeah. I do think breakthroughs can create wealth if it's managed properly, like huge windfalls, right? Um, yep. But, uh, but there's two models for folks to look at. Um, and so, yeah. Um, stay with the question long enough, you'd be surprised at some of the answers you can get. So I was asked, I was on a, a show, uh, another show, not mine, but somebody else's show uh, the other day. Regis and, and Kathy and, Lee. Oh, that yes. was not anymore. Was it Michael <laughs> Strahan? Well, <laughs> they asked me, do you think short term or long term? Yes. I said, I act short, but I think long. Yeah. And I said, I never sacrifice. I want immediate results. I want the breakthrough stuff, but I will never do it to sack. I will never sacrifice the long term for the short term gain. But I, I am always working towards like, let's just simplify this, right? And let's just say I was trying to sell you something, right? And we're, you're, you've reached out to us or we reached out to you and you're interested in buying a product. I'm looking to close you right now, but I'm not going to do it if it jeopardizes or set you up in a program that jeopardizes something long-term that could be much bigger and better, mm -hmm. whether it's the relation, whatever it might be, I mm -hmm. think long, I'll act short, but I'll think long-term. And I, and I always do what's in the best, the greater good of that. So can I give you an example of that in where we align? So Jamil reached out about a year, year and a half ago regarding some initiatives you guys had. And yeah. I saw them coming through and I, you know, basically sent him an email or a phone call. And I said, Hey, I said, right now, my opinion, 
the organization won't carry the water the way it needs to be carried on that exercise. And I said, right. so I would take us off the table, but when we're ready, I'll tell you, and then you'll know if there, if you have a need, okay, you don't even have to wonder if we can execute because if we're sitting there telling you, you'll know, same thing. I'm not going to risk right. the relationship for the sale right. because the name is worth way more. Again, significance is the motivation here, right? How long can I make an impact on your organization? How long can I impact these people? I know it's not eternal, but how far can I take that? And um, that challenges me, buddy. That challenges me. It makes me think outside of myself. Um, the other thing is when you start putting your people together and asking those big questions, do you ever notice how there's a there's a there's an Elvis in the choir? You know what I'm saying? Where it's like, whoa, <clears throat> look how dude thinks. Look at yeah. her. I've never seen that out of her. Like, I love that. I love finding I the Elvis in the choir where it's just the choir. We're all supposed to be able to just be average singers, if you will. And all of a sudden, here's somebody. And I'm like, she's a soloist. You know, have you noticed that? I, I love it. Well, as a business owner, what you recognize immediately, right, is this person's got a passion. A, a there's something to this person. They're not here for a check. They're here to make a difference and, and have a, a significant impact. So that, when people do that, that's why we like it, right? Because as a business owner, we're sitting there and, and recognizing and say, all right, we got somebody on this team that really wants to, to make a difference here. There's that and there's the lid. What did Maxwell say? You remember 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell? You remember I that do, but you're gonna you're gonna have I have, but you're gonna have to remind me. I, I my gut is telling me you know these 21, you could rattle off all 21, whereas I could not. <laughs> I got to do a few things with him uh through uh, this organization called Equip. So I got to meet him and spend time with him and love how he thinks. But yeah, the first one is this the, an organization. Here's the here's the top of the organization, okay? And yep. this is the lid, this is the leader. An organization never grows beyond its lid. Yeah. So it's called the law of the lid. So if your organization needs to be this tall and your leader is this tall, buddy, you and I have to be able to see that. We have to be able to. And, and so to me, those questions are also a drill around that. I cannot tell you how many times I've either a found leaders that can take us farther inside an organization or B realized, uh oh, that person can only take us so far. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. And that goes not just to the top of the organization, but the teams within it, your sales team, who's their leader. It's only going to, it's the same. <laughs> Can I give you another one? Me, yeah, absolutely. Myself, you, you did it with Jamil. You pulled yourself out of the way. Yeah. And I'm, I watched that. Like I have one particular business and I have two that I've already done that with where like yeah. they, their SME level, their subject matter expertise is such that I'm I'm going to kind of fan the flame. You know, I'm going to resource the initiative. I'm going to add ideas where I think it can help, but I am going to encourage them to lead well. Um, right. So, yeah, there's, again, the game is significance. I'm trying to take it as far as I can. Doesn't matter if it's me. Doesn't matter. It, it best idea wins. All right, let's start. Let's start asking some questions. Let's dive into some of the things we do during the masterminds. Wait, didn't we already right. ask questions? All well, we did, have, but but now we're really going to get into the meat. Oh joy! So, okay, it's been great so far. Okay, so great. I am thinking. All right, we've got things that limit our growth, right? And you can keep this specific to dealerships, but what I want the audience to pay attention to, obviously, if you're a dealer, you need to listen to specifically what's going on here. If you're outside of auto, you need to think about the question we're about to ask. And then more importantly, um, as we get into solutions, uh, how we come about those, because I think any industry, any business leader can apply the techniques we're about to do uh, into their own, uh, create their own opportunities, handle their own issues, handle their own problems. All right. So what would you say? It's one of the questions we ask right out of the gate in our breakthroughs. What would you say are the three biggest challenges, obstacles, or barriers that limit growth potential in a dealership? 
I love this question. I love that you make it three and I, I love this question. Okay. Yep. Um, from my perspective, uh, I think I'm going to do this categorically because not everybody watching is automotive, but if you're in automotive, we're going to be able to speak to it clearly. So, uh, so this is a macro. Okay. Um, these three I'd be looking for and I'd be ready to overcome. And, and probably the big three in automotive, are, by the way, are the same big three in all of business and life. And I learned this from Bob Beal, um, who's a friend, mentor, turns 80 in about two weeks. Um, he's an incredible guy. Anyway, uh, I, the three Fs, the three Fs. These are the three biggest challenges you face. And, and so like you're expecting me to say um, cash flow or innovation. And I'm going to go up a couple clicks. Okay. The three Fs. Scott, did you ever get any Fs on your, forget it. I won't ask you in front of everybody. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> thank God, um, thank God, Sandy Sarami's not on this episode. <laughs> I knew there was gonna be a Sandy. But God bless you, Sandy. Sorry you weren't here, bro. Okay. So the first F is fog, fog. The second F is fatigue, and the third F is flirtations. Those three will take you. It's kind of like getting on the Titanic. They're going to keep you longer than you want to stay. They're going to cost you more than you want to pay. They're going to take you farther than you want to go. You know, all that, right? So let me unpack each one. Fog. Fog is about clarity, right? So, let, Scott, let's say you and I, we want to go drive F1s on the Autobahn in Germany. And, and we have the date set for June. And you and I get there. And really weird. They have this huge storm system roll through the night. <clears throat> we land. We're racing the next morning or driving, if you will, on the Autobahn. And it is so foggy, we can't even see our hand in front of our face. Scott, how fast are we going to drive? Not very fast, right? right? So to me, the very first challenge or obstacle or barrier is businesses that lack clarity. They, they cannot clearly see. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, or the leader can see, but he's talk, he or she is talking to themselves. Like the organization yeah. cannot see. That's a problem. You got to be able to clearly be able to see, uh, to be able to, you know, A, cast the vision, B, gain buy-in, if you're going to go fast. And speed, yeah. I don't think it's always the big that eat the small, as it's been said. It's the fast that eat the slow, right? So well, it's kind of... And going to your point, right? It, it, once you have that vision, once you get buy-in, all right, can then everyone in the organization clearly uh, do a great job articulating it? Can it? Is it just on the salespeople that have a good elevator pitch and know it down? And by the way, most sales teams don't have that down. So, yeah. But it should be the entire organization that can clearly articulate what that vision is and more importantly, how you're going to help clients or your prospects get there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for that person out there right now listening, it says, Scott, how do I do that? I'm going to give it to you in a word. You ready? Repetition. Yep. Repetition. To, yep. Yes. I mean, how many of us have, gosh, I've told them. I've already presented this. I've already shown them. Okay. Did you say that with your kids when they kept running out in the street? You know, or did you, you, you know, there's this, I always would tell my kids, Scott, you've heard me say this, but you know, I can't tell you how many thousands of conversations I've had one-on-one -on -one with my kids, but I always say, hey, look, remember 70-30, 70% 70 of what I'm telling you, I've told you before, 30% is fresh. So if you hear if you hear yourself saying, dad, you've already told me, you need to ask yourself, I wonder why he's telling me that again. 70% yeah. is repeat. You need to yep. hear it yep. again. You need to hear yep. it again. And so in business, it's no different. If you haven't shown them, presented it seven, eight, nine times, you haven't told them yet. Yeah. That's just, and then, oh, by the way, the quality of your communications, the response you get, you know, I'm, sometimes, you know, it's like, hey, I've told them. Uh, yeah, you told them, you told them once. And by the way, it was kind of soft the way you told them. It wasn't even that great. And look how they responded. Clearly, you didn't communicate very well. Like if you right. took ownership of your communication and it was basically the response you got, now, does that mean you got to yell at them to get there? Not necessarily. Not unless you want to eventually lose your credibility in your audience. But to me, really owning that exchange makes you a great teacher, uh, makes you a great leader. Those are some things that are in your control. Um, the, I think the rule to communicating that stuff, just to kind of go down the rabbit hole, is flexibility. He or she who is most flexible wins. To me, it's like just because I said it and you didn't do it, 
doesn't mean I'm mad at you. It means I'm going to find a way to move you emotionally, mentally. Yeah. I'm going to find a way to connect with you to where I, I can smile and go, he's got it. He's running with this. Mu this must be your son coming in. <laughs> oh, really? Why? Is that, is it, said? Is, is Spencer facts. Oh, I, hey, I've Spen heard that saying once or twice. Thanks dad. <laughs> oh, good to see you, buddy. Love you, man. Hey, by the way, so, Spencer is taking me to the masters in 50 days. Oh, I know. Somebody's now that's a good. son. Yeah. I hope if my son is listening right now, I hope he's paying attention. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> so let me, so let that's me, fog. So that's fog. You want me to talk about fatigue? Well, well, before you do, let me just add one little thing to that. Cause I, I love that because okay. let's just say how many companies actually did a really good job creating or documenting their core values. And by the, by the way, when you're, when you're doing that, it's not what your core values, what you want them to be. Your core values are what they are. And they're not necessarily something that you do every single day, 24, seven, 365, but they are what you are when you're at your best Yeah, and what you strive to be right. Yeah. Because we all make mistakes. We don't always live up 100% to, to what our core values are. But they are wh what you are at your best. Yeah. And so one of the things that we do is because obviously we have our year-end meetings, our quarterly meetings, and we cover our core values. But you got to live it. Every evaluation, we grade based of, on our core values. Mm -hmm. So we're evaluating each employee based on our core values and, and explaining that when we hire, we have serious discussions about our core values and questions that try to uncover, do they have the, our core values? Do they share them uh, or do they not? So, I mean, how often that's do you just one example. It? How often do you revisit it with the team? The What's core the values? Team? Yeah. Yeah. Just bringing them up or going back to them. How often? Our core values are daily. If we have conversations, we always tie into, in other words, when we're commuting, communicating throughout, whether it's, it depends on what the conversation's yeah. about, right? Yeah. There's opportunities every day with somebody to either bring up your vision, yeah. your goals, why we're doing things, what your core values are, how they align with that vision. There's always an, or our elevator pitch. What is it that we actually do? How do we communicate it? Mm -hmm. Depending on the conversation, mm -hmm. these are things you have to reinforce daily mm -hmm. and always fit, not force them into conversation, fit them in when they're, when it's naturally inappropriate. And, mm -hmm. but there's opportunities all day long, every day to do that. That's exceptional. I just want to say what you're doing is exceptional and it's rare. It is not common. Scott, if I say I pledge allegiance, you can already plug in the next words, right? Correct. Yep. You and I grew up in a time going to school. We said that every morning. And if we went to yep. a parochial school, a Christian school, whatever, we probably said the Lord's Prayer, right? Yep. And it's engraved. Isn't that interesting? And, and, yeah. and so, you know, whatever you focus on is most real to you, whatever you repeat. So if, if that's important to you, what you're hearing from Scott, I mean, he's living it out. And that is repeat, man. You know, put that sucker on repeat. Just loop it. And um, I, I want to give you a quick example. Tractor Supply Company is a, a primary vendor for us at Third Day Ranch. Fortune yeah. 300 company, and it's an incredible organization. At one point in the last three years, I remember looking up the, the, fa the, 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 the highest increase in stock value in the, over the last two decades. And guess who number two is? Ooh. Tractor Supply. Look it up. Yeah. It's fascinating to me. So uh, $200 stock today and, you know, in 2011, it was 27 bucks, roughly, if I remember right. So anyway, <clears throat> tractor supply. They had this little laminated card about like such, about like this wide. And, uh, and it ha on the front, it has their values. And on the back, it's sort of like, this is our marching orders. These are our business roles. And it's laminated. And everybody in the store, if you go to a tractor supply store, ask them for, for if they have their laminated card. And so my point is, that's another example of how they're reinforcing what they believe in and what their credo is and what they're marching to. Um, you know, there are some organizations out there that um, you can get off track, but here's the good news. That's why you kind of take, you know, an hour and listen to something like this and say, okay, these are the three things I'm going to, we're going back to. 
these are going to be our, our blocking and tackling, you know? So uh, that's what I love about small and medium sized business. You can pick. Yeah, we correct. It is so quick. You can do these things in, in, uh, um, you know, we created our core value cards that employees will write to each other when they've recognized that someone has demonstrated a, a core value, whether it's something they did above and wow. beyond for a client. Uh, so it's just little things that, that, but to your point, it's got to, it's, it's got to be nonstop all the time yes. because it doesn't just, you can't just do it in a meeting and here's our year end meeting. Here's our goals next year. And then no one ever asks how we're going to get there. And, and, you know, and I believe in having big goals, right? And big goals require to ask intelligent questions. So first question I have real quick, because the show's going really good. And I think we're given a lot of good stuff here. We've, <laughs> we've got it for an hour and we're not through a lot. So my question is, do you, can we, can you go longer than an hour? Yeah, I can go longer and I definitely All want right. to finish. Do I get the finish? That's what I was saying. Time. I don't want to cut okay. us off because we're on okay. a roll. Yeah. Um, so I right, go on with fatigue. Okay. So fatigue, what did Lombardi say? He said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I, it makes you tap out. So, yeah. you know, you they just wear out. So here's my question without unpacking it fully. How do, you, how do you offset that? Like, look at what you've done in your life from a health standpoint. You know, you've made some changes, right? Yeah, but no one, no one wants to follow my health my, no, my no, this, I know this, the business bourbon and cigars <laughs> thing. Yeah. But I have watched you make some moves, um, you know, but, but the bottom line is you got to pay attention to fatigue. Um, I do think, and maybe you'll ask me today any, something around this, but I do think some of our fatigue is self-induced. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Like we cause it. Um, so, so fatigue, but fatigue will make you tap out too early. So have a pulse for not only your own, but your teams. And so we look for opportunities, you know, around that. And then flirtations was Bob's third one. Flirtations is it, it's distraction. Uh, it's losing focus. Um, it's tangents like that. For me is one I have to really rein myself in on because and what I mean by that is not being on a tangent, but team members that want to take us on one drives me batty because uh, let me ask you a question. This is just to you personally. A lot of people I feel like that are good visionaries. Like for me, this is my, ch what you're saying right here is my biggest challenge for me personally. And I say that because patient. correct, because Oh, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity. I could, I could do this. I could do that. And it is to your point, I've got to find, I've got to consciously tell myself, stay focused on what, uh, what is most important here, discipline and focus. Everyone talks about time being the most valuable thing. I do not believe it is. I believe your discipline and your focus is more important than time. Time is more important than money. But if it, with discipline and focus, you can actually create, it's not creating more time, but with the right discipline and focus, you do create more time for yourself to get other things done because you're, you're knocking out projects. You're staying true to it. You're, you're not just sitting there starting this and that and everything else that distract you and nothing ever gets finished. This is a deeper combo, buddy. This one will go <laughs> oh, yeah. way down the manhole, but, but I, I like what you're saying. OK, I do. And there's and there's got to be people listening that are nodding their heads saying the same thing. Here's the thing. Um, I'm just give you just one or two little things that I'll, I'll say here a lot. Like Rob Canales is our VP of product dev. He is savant smart. Rob is so sharp. And um, he and I will always talk about like pro projects that are going to take X amount of time. And I'll always say to him, hey, buddy, remember, remember watch the clock. And what I'm talking about is the ball game, you know, because, you know, it, he is so good at detail and features. And so I, it's just my way of saying, remember, if you throw a touchdown pass in the end zone, but nobody's in the stands, they've all left. That means the game's over. So we got to do it. Well, the clock's still running and people are still here for it to count. And um, so what we use, his strength is taking us, to levels of detail and strategy and even features.
that a lot of people don't see or won't execute on. So he has this focus. But the offset of that is it's got to happen in a certain window. Otherwise, that exercise won't matter because the ship has already sailed. We miss that sale. We miss that market. Does that make sense? So, yes. so it, so the focus. So there's times where I'll be like, hey, look, pare that down. We got to pare that down. The, look, this is the window we have to deliver that in. Do you see it? Well, okay. Have you talked to the client? No. Okay. Do you trust me or do you want me to get you in front of them where you can hear it with your own ears? I trust you. Okay. I'm promising you how much you want to bet that if we deliver with everything that's being said and we deliver it outside of that window, we get zero. I believe you. Okay. And so those are just ad hoc examples of taking a hyper talented person and balancing it with, they have focus, but sometimes that focus can be so deep. Okay. Now, what about the guy who, you know, like Bob Gower is super creative. He's a developer. He's our chief operating officer. Bob can take, you know, this bottle cap and he can turn it into macaroni and cheese. He can talk to you about how it's a tire. He, you know, Bob, Bob can take some, you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh yeah. I call him the metaphor master because he's, it's like, it's like, you know, and he can just, and so, but with Bobby, same thing, just incredible strength. And yeah. so it's like, okay, but Hey buddy, I, we don't need you to develop this into anything else except for what it is. That's what it is. Cause that's what we can scale and support. So he'll tell you the same thing. So does that make him a bad guy? Heck no. These are guys that we wouldn't be who we are without these two guys. But I use those two guys as an example to say, do you see where flirtations can get you in trouble? Yeah. And they get, you know, even with great, talented people who are in the prime of their careers. And it's like yeah. being able to see that is huge, buddy. You know who does? And, and it'd be great if every team and every organization or business was great at this, but the really good IT, you bring up IT and software, and I know you've got a good team there. But I feel like more than any other team, if if the team is good, IT and software teams do a phenomenal job at at avoiding the flirtation. And, and here's where I'm going with this. And in, 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 when you have a good team, you've got this big, huge goal, right? Yeah. We want to knock this out. And we want to have this product, this service, because we think this is a game changer and it's got to be completed in 90 days. All right. All right. So then you ask the questions, how can we accomplish this within 90 days? And then you start game planning the steps that have to happen. And what does a great IT team do? They start chunking it down step by step in two week sprints, right? So yep. they got these sprints and all they do in those sprints is they focus on knocking, not the big goal, this first step yep. to get to that goal, then the second step. And they avoid all those flirtations. And lo and behold, yep. either before or at the 90 may day mark, the goal is achieved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're masters at it. You know, the bottom line to those big three, brother, is anybody that's watching, it, those are the three you want to watch for, right? And you want to ward them off. And, and they're disguised as many things, you know, but categorically, they're going to get in the way of progress. And if you yep. look for them and you guard against them, what you'll find is your, your gains may or may not be fast, but your gains you will hold. You will continually make gains. And all of a sudden it's like, look at these cats. How the heck did they get there? One brick at a time. And just progress. And they're That's good. Right at avoiding fog, keeping it clear. They're good at avoiding fatigue, keeping it fresh. Yeah. They're good at avoiding flirtations. They stay focused. And you don't want to have to compete against them because what they got the quote, What was the quote you said about fatigue again? Something about makes cowards or? Yeah, Lombardi. Fear makes cowards of us all. Yeah. So, or fatigue makes cowards of us yeah, all, fatigue right? Fatigue makes yeah. cowards of yeah. us all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me, late in his career with Mike Tyson, uh, when clearly, you know, very late in the last few fights, he wasn't what he was and wasn't committed to it. Right. The training and everything else. Yeah. And, um, and I think it was Lennox Lewis that he fought and Teddy Atlas, his former trainer, he said it best because, you know, he was sitting there getting hit and eventually knocked out. 
And everyone was talking about, wow, former champion, look at his heart, look at his commitment. And Teddy said, oh, no, 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 no. He goes, in boxing, sometimes the easy path is going ahead and getting punched versus putting out the effort, which can be more difficult when you're fatigued. Putting out effort is much harder than it is just to get punched. <laughs> and That's to, rich. Yeah. That's and rich. Think about that. That is, I think anybody that's played any sport can probably associate a little bit to that. If you're tired, yeah. sometimes it's easier to go through the motions and get your, your, your ass kicked yep. than it is to put out the energy and do what it takes to actually win or try yep. to win. Yep. Uh, okay. I remember Jamie Foxx line where he would do this joke about Mike Tyson. And he's like, every time I did this joke, everybody laughed. He goes, it was a guaranteed, you know, the ceiling came down kind of thing. And he goes, I'm at such and such location. And I tell the joke, nothing, nobody laughs. And finally somebody says, Mike's in the house, man. <laughs> he was in the Mike, room. If Mike was Mike's there. And it was like, I, I wouldn't have told that. that. I wouldn't have told that joke if Mike was in here. Correct. So he, I mean, he's in better shape now than he was just ten years ago. I mean, he's in unbelievable shape. All right. Yeah. So now that you've got, you've identified these big challenges, obstacles, barriers that keep us from from uh, or limit our growth potential. I want if we could solve one of those right now, and I, now you're going to have to get specific. So if you say fog or fatigue or flirtation, you're going to have to get specific as to. Uh, what it is. So let's take the dealership world for a second, right? Okay. We could eliminate one of them right here and now on this show. Give us a specific example um, of identifying one that would have the biggest impact on a dealership's growth. All right. I'm, I'm going to do an end around here because they're all going to be an issue. Yeah, but I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to answer your question. I have some good news for you. All right. When you look at those three, what I would do before I pick the one, it, to me, I would start with the word perspective. Here's why. It's been said perspective is worth like 50 IQ points. Have you ever heard that? I have not, but I, now I have. That's why I do these shows. I learn, I learn more on these shows <laughs> that it's like reading, you know, 500,000 books a year. I mean, it's unbelievable. Perspective is worth 50 IQ points. So if we focus on one without perspective, we're sort of talking to ourselves. So some people here, let me apply this. So some people appear smarter, but they might not be as wise in life's practical applications. Can you, can you oh, yeah, align with that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's the book old smart, book, smart, street, smart, bingo, bingo. Yeah. So, so Peter Jennings, you remember Peter Jennings, right? Yep. yep. Uh, and Will Rogers. Right. TCU, yep. well, Will Rogers I, Stadium. You know, I mean, they, I don't know. Remember Will Rogers. I'll have to I'll refer to Sandy. I'm sure he does. That's funny because I saw him talking about <laughs> Sandy. And anyway, um, <laughs> so Peter Jennings and Will Rogers had one thing in common. They never finished high school. Yeah. Wow. OK, so you start with a healthy and accurate perspective. OK, Um. So, so that's one. I think if I had to pick one of those three to prioritize, I, it would be flirtations. Okay. Which is the one you mentioned. All right. So uh, why? Well, so give us an example, give us a specific example in, in your world yeah. with, with dealerships where they flirt with something else and don't focus in on what would have the biggest impact on their growth. Yeah. Well, the big one is obvious. It's, you know, our PVR per vehicle retail, we spend 600 bucks per NADA. You know, I know there's a store out there that says, well, we only spend 380. The average of the rolled up financial statements in the industry, 17,000 new car dealers is 625 bucks a car, roughly. Okay. That number has just went up and to the right over the years. Would you agree with me? I mean, you're, yep. you're in automotive with me, you know, yep. marketing costs. Okay. So, so we spend 600 and some bucks to buy the customer. And we hardly spend anything to keep them, you know? So to me, our distractions, I just want to say with flirtations, I'm going to kind of attach these two. Um, our distractions are built into our lives. And by the way, I mean, I turned this sucker off when you and yeah. I started this show. Yeah. Okay. 
But here's your first culprit. I love the tool, but let's be honest. You know, it's devil, oh, yeah. right? Okay. And then what, what sits on this thing? All the social media, all the, okay. Again, I, I understand we're doing LinkedIn and YouTube right now. Those are social yep. tools, right? Yep. So, so right, right now we want people to stay on social, but we are advising them once this show's over to make their comments and likes on our stuff, but then get off of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, what did the Greeks say? Moderation and all things. I mean, the bottom yeah. line is it means to an end and all that. So in automotive, the flirtation, Scott, is always on the front end. It's to sell more iron. Let's be honest. Correct. And, oh, yeah. and, and, you know, the, the strategic play is own your UIOs. What's a UIO? Units in operation. What is that? Those are vehicles that were registered, okay, RDR'd retail delivery from my point. They're now in my primary market area, my PMA. And I am supposed to be as an overture, um, shepherding that relationship that only, through my service department and through anything else that happens in that customer's journey. And that's where it goes from black and white to gray. And it, you know, it's not a new phenomenon. You know, it's only been around the whole time, decades, Plural, true, right? Am I talking yeah. to myself or you agree? Yeah. I'm following and, 100%. And there's a ton of Band-Aids, buddy. There's a ton of Band-Aids thrown at that, you know? Um, you know, we need to do this. We need to do that. Um, recalls, you know, I won't go super deep on this, but like, you know, there's tens of millions of recalls per year. We've been over 50 million a year for now for almost a decade. Okay, almost yeah. a decade. It's 70 million. Uh, Takata airbag obviously was, was a big part of that, but I found it interesting, the amount of attention we gave to recalls and, and I thought in a way it was healthy and it is healthy, but it's almost like, again, we're just focusing on one part. It's that whole relate. It's just one more reason to stay in front of the customer. Right. right. So yep. the flirtation of going and buying more market share so that, you know, it's like buying a boat and putting it in the slip and never going down to it. Why, why, why are you paying for the slip? Why you buy the boat? It just, to me, the logic isn't there. So, um, flirt. Well, one of the best ways to grow market share, John, as you know, is don't have as much leaking out of the bottom of the bucket. So that way, whatever you're putting in at the top, you know, that water level increases. <laughs> if you're losing as many as you're, as you're gated, you're, you're not gating anything. We have a couple guys might be saying or gals saying, hey, give me a give me an application, the antidote. The antidote of flirtation is focus, right? Correct. So yep. it takes discipline and discipline has a reward. OK, and I'm going to talk about that for a sec. But in automotive, you say, give me an example, John. OK, pick up and delivery. How many cars today are being picked up and delivered back to the customer for service? Mobile van, Ed Roberts. He's heralded this. He's championed it. He's killing it. Right. Ed's yeah. a big part of business bourbon and cigars and some other events going on in automotive. And Ed is frontline. What Ed does so well is what he's passionate about. You ready? Growing people. That's Ed's yeah. passion, isn't it? Is. it? Yeah. Yes, it's it not is. mobile vans. It's not pickup and delivery. Ed, Ed is a a true. If if there's ever you talk about pushing positive energy and and giving. And it comes back to you. Ed's like a really good example of that because he, it's not just his employees, right? I could use the business bourbon and cigars. I mean, he's one of our biggest supporters. He gets, Ed is about helping people. If if you are someone that he views as a, I think a good person that is trying to help people. I mean, he is all in and will do whatever it takes. I feel like um, to help anyone. I To me, he's just one of my favorite people. Me too. I love that you brought him up. Me too. Now, the flirtation piece, um, you know, I, and again, I would say this to my kids often, but it's, you know, it's your decision. Okay. But the consequence or reward is 100% yours. So, and usually that would produce, well, what do you think, Dad? You know, well, right. have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? But I want them to learn to fish. I want them to learn to make good decisions. Right. And so, um, so the discipline has a reward, but flirtations has a consequence. See, so that's the other thing. If you're going to flirt, no, you're going to get fingers chopped off, folks. 
You know, it's right. going to cost you something. Now, you say, John, give me a practical way to kind of develop this discipline. Okay, I'll tell you what's worked really well for me. I don't know if it'll work for you, but I'm happy to share it. I schedule a half a day, Scott, every month just to focus. Literally, a half a day, there is no phone, there is no, and all I do is focus. And what I would challenge the audience to do is do this for 12 consecutive months. Pick the time. I don't care when it is, day or night, doesn't matter. Block off four hours. You're talking one to 2% of your time. Okay. Yeah, and you do that even. every month. And what you, what you want to do is you want to reflect. You want to look and see where flirtations are at play. Got it. Yeah. And compare it to what? To what the original course was. See? And when you do this, Scott, if you do this for four hours, you just block it off. Go to your favorite coffee shop, whatever. Uh, put on instrumental music. Break out your, your notepad or whatever it is you use and, and get after it. You will be shocked at the level of focus that you can bring back to the game. And I'm talking the game before those four hours every month. That's it. Just a you know, little bit of time. I'll tell you I'll tell what you I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to also add it to something else. So part of my daily routine is I end my day after I plan my next day. Um, I sit quietly in my, my office at home and I journal. And I just yeah. started doing this about a year and a half ago. I love it. I was never a journaler, but I, I started doing it. And I thought, all right, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing this. And I write down my wins for the day, what I accomplished, some things I didn't accomplish. Why do I think I didn't do it? But I'm going to make a conscious effort to reflect on what I flirted with that might've pulled me away on my focus. Cause I have four or five things that every morning I write down that if I had to start the day over again, I'd want to do more of, I, I put pray more. I put stay disciplined, stay focused, stay uncomfortable. Um, comfort convenience is, is a, it's a bad thing for me, right? Because when, when I am, when I put a value on wanting to be comfortable or convenient, I tend to not lean into doing the things that need to be done that to get out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to stay uncomfortable. I want to stay disciplined. I want to stay focused and I want to pray more. Those are my things. Um, so I'm going to reflect at night and journal, be a, make a conscious effort on what you just said. So I'm going to do this daily. Um, not for four hours daily, but maybe yeah. once a month daily, but I can, I can spend a few minutes while I'm doing my journaling, putting this into it. And I, I think that's genius on your part. Great. Great. I'm glad. I'm glad at least one person is running with it. It's helped me <laughs> massively. And I'm actually mm, a little reticent uh, as I look back at certain stages of my life where I'm like, dang, I wish I would have been doing that then. Um, so yeah. I definitely see the benefit um, and there's a, I want to bring up, Hey John, yeah, I want to bring up another thing when it comes to flirtations. Cause you and I were talking a few weeks ago and something came up and, and I, and I, I might've been talking about my stores. I don't remember the, what we were specifically talking about, but you talked about the number of calls my, my service department might get. And it, this goes to what you're talking about with, with focus. Right. In other words, if if dealers only paid more attention to where the volume is and where our interactions are with clients on a daily basis. And I I don't know if you remember that part of that conversation, mm -hmm. but if you if you do, could you kind of expand on that a little bit? Because I think it, it aligns with what we're talking about here. So you may have to guide me a little bit. I was driving. Uh, I do remember when we talked, it was raining. Yeah. And we were having a good combo. So, yeah. okay. So I, I'm going to kind of, you just kind of guide me, but okay. So <clears throat> let's say you have a hundred car a month store and Scott's store is bigger than that, but I'm just going to use a hundred car a month store. That store is going to get <clears throat> 10 to 12 sales calls a day on average. Um, and that store is going to get 65 to 75 service calls a day on average. Yeah. Okay. So let's think about it. On the showroom floor, we're selling 100 cars a month, 10 cars per person. So we have 10 salespeople. We got 10 to 12 calls. Each person is going to take about a call. Got it? So far, so yeah. good, yeah. right? Okay, in service, that store is going to have three service advisors, right? And they're going to yeah. have 65 to 75 calls. Oh, by the way, they're also going to each write 15 open repair orders today with real human beings 
that are hoping you're not going to screw up their life or their car or their day. Got it? And they're going to each take another 20 plus calls and start setting up tomorrow. And they're going to handle the status calls that are coming in from the cars that are in there today. How are we doing so far? Doing good. You're right yeah. on. Yeah. So, so it's kind of like this aha, like how long has this been around? Pretty much forever. Like grandma's always cut the ends of the ham off, but the reason she started was the pan was too small, right? Why they did this back in the day, I don't know, but we still do it today. That makes zero sense. So one of the things that I've said many times is said, look, the service advisors forgot more about scheduling appointments than any coordinated effort ever will truly know. Just, and that's my way of sort of saying, it's not that you're doing a you're not able to do a great job. It's not that you don't have the acumen. You don't have something more important, time, uninterrupted time. And that exchange is very, very important. Yesterday, sidebar comment, Dawn and I went to our favorite restaurant for Valentine's Day, set the reservation up a couple of weeks in advance. Food was great. Time was great. But the gatekeeper there, Scott, is always like <laughs> horrible, like you almost feel like soup Nazi from Seinfeld, like, you know, you know, and, and it's just this show every time. And I just think to myself, what a shame if the food wasn't so yeah. good, I just wouldn't come back here. You know what I mean? But her and I've been doing it for 30 years. So, um, so to me really looking for, okay. Um, when Bezos got the vision for that, that what's that company called that he started? I remember it's, it's on the Google. tip of my tongue. Yeah. I'll have to Google it. Something's <laughs> on. Yeah. Um, what he saw was music and book sales. You remember that? And he was counting yep. the iterations of mu uh, basically albums, you know, and books being sold. And in yeah, his yeah. mind, he's thinking margin on that. Okay. Well, he, I remember Dawn, my wife saying to me, she's like, this is like 2000. And I was like, well, you know, she's telling me about Amazon. And I was like, ah, oh, that'll never make it. And she's like, really? Why? I said, that's too narrow. That's too narrow. Well, little did I know that that logo, if you look carefully, the arrow yeah. from the A to the Z, guess yep. what that implied? Everything yeah. from A to Z. I just <laughs> yeah. didn't understand the vision yet. Got it? Yeah. My gut was right, okay, at the time, but I didn't have perspective, like I just spoke to a minute ago, right? Right. Uh, hold on, Daniel, son, is what Jeff would have said. We're just getting started, right? We're doing yeah. books and we're doing, and we're going to kind of master this. And then we're going to start adding stuff. Now, what did they actually make? They don't make anything. Nothing. To me, that's like eBay 2.0. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's right. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I love these kind of combos because when you start well that's and that's where i got you use the word iterations right and that's where so if we're sitting here saying all right one of the things that you you we, we identified you identified the three f's fog fatigue flirtations is some of the biggest challenges or, or obstacles that keep us from driving growth and yeah. then you said uh you know flirtations would be the number if i could choose one to fix right now it would be flirtations and so you're sitting here saying I'm flirting with all these stuff instead of focusing in on all these iterations, all these connections that I've got coming through the service. And if I only focus there, I I drive more growth than anything else I do. Yeah. Yeah. If we count money in terms of gross profit, service is going to win every day. Yeah. Service is going to win every day. Unless you're doing something so as, as such an outlier, like you're crushing equity mining at such a ridiculous number. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. not something 80% of the stores in the United States are going to be able to do. So, so let's but even the, the equity mining, but even the equity mining, the easiest, the biggest wins come through the, the back end of through service. I, you took the words <laughs> out of my mouth. I was going to say, where are you going to go find that? You know? So, yeah. so yeah, it's kind of like, Hey, um, you know, it's asking the right questions. You know, we want to grow. Okay. How do we want to grow? Okay. And the significance question, again, I'm going to go back to that. If you have a dealership for sale, whose absorption is 140%, some ridiculous number. And for those that don't know what absorption is, if it costs a hundred thousand dollars a month to run that store, and that's, a, that'd be a tiny number, by the way, 140% would be that store generates $140,000 of gross profit 
gross profit from service and parts without selling a car. So like without selling a car, you know, you're already making money. Okay. And when you sell cars, now here's the next question. If that store is sitting at 140%, how much more aggressive can our used car manager be on those trades? Well, look, yeah. I don't know what That's you right. are across town, but I'm going to, I'm going to crush you. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to pay an extra grand for that car and I'm not going to sweat it. I may take a skinnier deal and used, but, but we're going to dominate market share because we have momentum because we've already won where we have to win. You get it. Correct. Then we're going to develop prepaid maintenance plans to where the customer doesn't even think about it. It's already included in the car. And so it's money burning a hole in their pockets. So they, they really almost have it's, to service with us. I, assuming I mean, I, you have a, yeah. Assuming you create a great client experience, which starts online and or by that mobile device, are you easy to find? Uh, you're competitive, you offer, but as long as you have a superior client experience, the easiest place to grow market share is in fixed stops in the dealership world. Um, for those thinking you got to be perfect at this, you know, I don't know Brian Benstock myself. I'm kind of at a distance, not really well, but one of the things I would compliment Brian on if I were talking to him is he's not afraid to make a mistake, Scott. And so sometimes no. like there's people out here listening. Brian, to Brian's an opportunity. I don't know I Brian know very is. well. Him and I have met very well, but he is very much. This is an industry and this is going to come back on me, but this is an industry where people talk about wanting to try new ideas but actions speak louder than words, right? And our actions as an industry don't always align with those words. But Brian is a true, Brian Kramer, by the way, is another guy who's now yes. on the other side of the aisle. But um, yes, they're not afraid. They, they, the opportunity, they're so driven by the opportunity. Great point with Kramer. That they want it. They'll take their, they'll take their risk, their educated risks. Yeah. So it's not like they're just, you know, I, I just want to just say for those that are afraid to try, look, make do your homework, right? Make educated yeah. guesses, but but don't be afraid to put it out there. Don't be afraid yeah. to to do your, your your betas and 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 you know if your intention is right. Again, if 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 it is to be significant, right? I mean, would you agree that what Ben Stock has accomplished with the Honda Acura store there, in, you know, in New York? is significant. I would. Yeah. I'd say yeah. It's incredibly significant. What Brian Kramer did. Well, I think what's more significant with what he's done is the, the longevity of it. Correct. There's the significant. You know, correct. It's, it's like, like David Spizak likes to say, it's easy to climb my Everest. It's a lot harder to live up there. <laughs> correct. Or even climb yeah. down. Yeah. Or even climb down. Yeah. Some people don't think about the climb down. Uh, and then Brian yeah. Kramer, you know, metaverse. I mean, when he was first talking about metaverse stuff, do you still at Jermaine? Uh, you know, I mean, right over my head, right? It was kind of yeah. like crypto, you yeah. know. Um, but well, it, but I've heard I've heard Brian John, I've heard Brian in rooms yeah. go toe to toe with people in a in a respectful way. Yeah. Um he's a pro on like used cars, right? Yep. Do I give numbers over the phone? Do I give action? Do I give an actual trade appraisal over the phone or on the internet, email, text, however you're, you're communicating? And he's a big proponent in doing that. Whereas some of the old school way is no, I need to get them there. I got to appraise it. I'm not going to take a chance. I'm not going to empower my people to do that type of stuff. But he's done the difference between the reason his argument wins. I think his argument wins for me is because it's backed by he's actually studied it. And I can't remember how long his his control study was, whether it was six months or 12 months where he's done it both ways. And did they lose deals or did they miss and maybe cost themselves on some occasional values by by hitting the number wrong? Maybe the car comes in. It's not as nice as the way the client described it, whatever. He says the money, the gain far outweighed the loss. The gain was far more, much worth it by giving the client what they needed in a quick, easy number up front versus playing the games or trying some of the old school methods that we've done in the past. His is backed by an actual study where he's done it both ways. Yeah. All right. And so to me, that's when I go, I sit there and say, I know I'm going to take a beating here and there. But in the end, which way do I win on? Which ways, which strategy is the one where I net the best result? Uh, 
confidence, this is an old axiom and it kind of flows into what you just said. So, so when you're doing something like that and you have confidence, where does that come from? It comes from predictability. Where does predictability come from? Something you've done before. So here's a guy who's testing what's going on, right? And going, hey, you know what? We actually do this with confidence because we've done it enough. For the person in the audience that's pushing back on Brian Kramer in that vein, right? In that circle, yeah. Scott, there's no confidence. Why? Because they haven't done it, right? Correct. So that's right. There's kind of the lesson, right? You can you yeah, can yeah. you can argue a point, but you really can't argue it well until you what? Until you try it. We well, hired a guy, back we worked on an interview this week, quick sidebar story. Uh, we had two two folks interviewing for a very high level position at the ranch operations. And uh, this is for one of our very important locations. And and so the first candidate, it was just amazing to me to hear how sharp this person was. And we were talking about um, basically how we approach certain processes, whether it was uh, merchandising, uh, storage, hauling, whatever. And there's very, you know, there's millions of dollars a year. There's, there's, I mean, there's a lot at stake doing these mobile stores and stuff, right? Rolling vans into major stores. Anyway, um, he asked a question and it was different than the way we did it. And here's what I said. I said, you know, I said, first of all, I love the question. Second of all, we thought the same thing at one point. Third, we tried it. Fourth, you want to hear what happened? Yeah, we got crushed. Here's what happened. We did this. We did this. We did. So we've already spent the money on that idea. So there's now if you want to pony up the money and try it again, I'm all for getting a front row seat. And he laughed. And I said, but we've tried that. However, keep the ideas coming, please. And he followed up with the recruiter and he's like, man, I see myself working with these guys. I love how they think. So the idea was we basically said no to his idea. Because we had tried it and we got crushed and we paid for it. But we also yep. said it in a way where it wasn't like, hey, Attila rules. It was like, hey, but if you want to bring your own cash to the table and roll the dice, maybe we did it wrong. Maybe you want to show us how to do that. No, no, that makes sense. I, I just I'd never tried it. So to me, that's how you test. Um, mm, are, are we having real conversations here or philosophical ones? How about that? Yeah. Well, going back to Brian Benstock with what you were saying earlier, if you look at what he does in terms of his pickup and, and delivery or drop off with his service, his service clients, his service customers, he charges a flat rate for that pickup and, and drop off. Doesn't matter where the client's coming from. Yep. So there are going to be some clients where he doesn't make as much or pot potentially, depending on the service work, loses money. But he has the confidence and the predictability because he's run the numbers. He's he's done the data. He's studied it. And he sits there and says, if I average, my, my average is this. So as long as I'm charging this for the pickup and drop off, it doesn't matter if I have the occasional loss. Quit worrying about the losses. Worry To Michael Poro's uh, point, quit worrying about losing and worry more about the winning, right? And, or and you fill your fuel. I like that too, yeah. Mike. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, hey, you know yeah, what's interesting I, I, about points. that charge about, you know, him charging for the pickup and delivery? You yeah. realize there are a, a few manufacturers reimbursing dealers and there's still more than a handful that don't want to participate in that process. That just blows me away. Like, OK, you still you're selling away. iron, but you are still selling parts. You're still That's selling right. parts. If I were you, I would reappropriate money. If you're a manufacturer who hasn't done that yet, I would reappropriate yeah. money towards pickup and delivery and get your retail network thinking about yeah. how do we engage this process? How do we deliver on this? You want to talk about saving money later when you have all those blank brand vehicles coming right back in your drives? Yeah. Let me, do you gravitate towards, do you gravitate more, do you gravitate more towards the person that goes after the win versus the someone that's a little more reserved and, and wants to protect. I love. Doesn't I, okay. mean we could. It doesn't mean we can't appreciate both. But yeah. where do you? I, I, who are your friends? 50, yeah, fifty-one forty-nine. Obviously, I'm going <laughs> to lean towards the attack. Yeah. But I want to make sure that 
we're all here and we got this right. You know what I'm saying? Well, you too. Absolutely. Listen, I wrote, this is perfect for my next question. So, all right. So we're asked, we've got these huge goals. We've asked right. the right questions and, so that have helped us come up with a game plan or a strategy to achieve them in the time frame. right? Yep. How do you approach risk management when it comes to business growth? What techniques do you use to reduce potential risks? When you're thinking risk, I think I'd suggest you have a system and have a system for staying out in front of risk management. So, okay. So what does that look like? So typically that starts with a strategic plan. Um, and you say, well, okay, how long should that be? I think in any small, medium sized business, it should be at least a 10 year outlook. Right. So like right now we have EV sitting here around us. Right. And, yep. you know, in one year, they're telling us next week, all cars are going to be electric and they're going to come pick up your, your, your ice engine. I'm exaggerating. Right. And in another, they're saying, well, shoot, we won't have enough grid until 20, you know, 95 or whatever. Right. I'm making this up. Okay. So again, extreme exaggerations just to not land anywhere, but to sort of show the point. Okay. So you want to stay out in front of risk management. Uh, in big companies, you're talking 50 years or more. Toyota had a hundred year business plan. And that was in 1995 when I was speaking, you know, and working with Toyota TMS nationally, a hundred years. Okay. Um, so you say, okay, John, give me a practical way of doing this. Okay. This is a system I use. Um, I have seven and five, seven and five, seven vital signs in each business that I have, Scott. And I have five critical standards that have to be in place. And everybody has a, um, they have a purview of this. It's on their phones. So, okay. Can I tell this story? Is this okay? Go right ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So, so first of all, why am I even going down this road when it comes to risk? You, you <clears throat> should be qualitative and quantitative with risk. You should be both. All right. Um, so, one of the struggles I had in like the 2013 through 2016 window was I saw, I saw leaders in the organizations that didn't know their numbers. They didn't know their numbers. Now coming out of the car business, what did they tell us the first week in the business? It's a numbers game, right? I always tell the story. It's a numbers game. They told you that they told me that it's yep. still a numbers game, but the numbers have changed, right? They evolve, right? It's not the exact same number, um, it's not 30% of walk-ins buy on the first visit or whatever, you know, Jackie B. Cooper, 1980 or 70, you know, right. it's evolved. Okay. So it's really important to make sure your numbers are legit, but you need to know your numbers. Tillman Fertitta, who owns a ton of restaurants, publicly traded, right? Um, that's one of his favorite things too with his leaders is know your numbers. Okay. So how can I do that? So I got with my CFO, Byron Youngblood, who's a star. And I'm like, buddy, <clears throat> I, I want to get these, this data in front of them on a regular basis. And here's why I said, I can't really work on accountability and I can't really expect a lot of growth if they don't know where they're at. Right. And he's like, okay, just tell me what you want to do. So I started looking at these different organizations that sell business objects and um, would be able to take data and put it in charts and mobilize it. And, and I found this company, you should write this down. Okay. It's called grow, grow, G R O W go grow.com or grow.com. And so, um, I don't spend a ton of money. I, well, I do, I spend thousands, but it's not a lot for what I get. Um, <clears throat> so you get a certain amount of tiles. Okay. And in the tile is a topic. So my seven vital signs and my five critical standards are in there and it's responsive. It, it's something they download on their phone. So you say, okay, John, apply this. Give me an example. Okay, so our new sales revenue for the month. That's that's one of our vital signs. We have an objective and every single person involved in that sees it. Oh, by the way, they're also tied to total revenue each year. So, the, and there's bonuses that are tied to it. So they know exactly where they're at. And then right. at the beginning of each month, we recap last month with that leadership team. We, Here's where at, da, da, da. they do their part and they under, they're running the business. They got it. Um, in the contact center space, there's things like ATT. What is that? Average talk time. 
There's things like ASA. What is that? Average speed to answer. That's how long people are holding. And we have standards there that we've created. We say, look, we got to have enough people to be able to do this and da, da, da. Turnover. We know what turnover costs us, so we measure it monthly. And they have a standard where they're at. And they're incentivized to create a work culture where that's where that turnover is low enough, lower than industry. So, so you say risk management. Risk is it starts out, I think, buddy, it starts out by getting out far enough in front and knowing what can create the issue. Then you know how to build the moat, if you will, around the business. These are the performing areas. Then you got to pare it down because what most will happen in a lot of businesses, you'll have so many of these. That, um, you know, basically, you know, if you're tracking everything, you're tracking nothing, right? So it's too much. So you get it down to seven and five. And, uh, you know, grow would be a great way, a great tool. Everybody here has it. Um, you got to know your numbers if you're in the game. And I think there's only two problems in business. There's knowing problems and doing problems. And so what I wanted to do with that exercise to, to be able to combat risk is I want to get rid of the knowing. Where there's no way you could ever say, John, I, I didn't know. Bro, can't say that. You got numbers just like everybody else. Yeah. And they're updated every day. So I tip my cap to Byron Youngblood, who sees to that in our organization, he and his team. And um, it's fantastic. So there you go. That's my whack at that. All right. Let's finish the show with this question. How important is client feedback and drive in business growth? And then what methods do you do use to like gather, uh, gather the feedback and then analyze it? Mm -hmm. Okay. In my opinion, business growth, it needs a simple way of being measured first. You can add to it from there, but it needs a simple way where everybody looks at it and agrees. Um, yeah. So you say, Joe, what do you use? I use two words, primary result, primary result. Um, it's simple term um that we use here to do it so in various businesses it changes but the single best measurable indicator of the overall health of the organization becomes our primary result and the way we measure that is um we ask we ask questions um you know it, it's as simple as is to our client is this working for you scott at this point yeah. would you say it's working for you uh, how are you guys utilizing it? How's it benefiting you? Um, and then here's another one. Scott, what do you need us working on next? Yeah. What does that imply? It implies continuity to the relationship. It implies that what we have is good, but we want to keep working and improving. So when, when they are succeeding, here's the message, buddy. You're in business. And when they're not, as they say, you're going out of business. It's that simple. Yeah. I, I was just hired to come in someone who's been following business bourbon and cigars uh, to go in. They're bringing in about 20 to 30 of their top clients. Um, this is a really big business. And, you know, they were struggling with these type of things of having people up there talk about best practices and all the same, same stuff. So I went over the format and so they're bringing me in to actually run through two different masterminds. And I said, let me let me tell you what's great about this. I said, for one, your clients are going to solve a lot of big issues and problems and create a lot of new opportunities for themselves. But while you guys are participating in this, you are going to hear firsthand what their their biggest challenges are, why they're important to them, why they are challenges. And this is an IT and software development company. I said, you're going to uncover you're going to uncover new products and services. I mean, they're basically going to tell you a wish list of everything that you need to create. Um, <laughs> that's what's going to come out of this. So we're going to, we're going to cover two different things. This is an industry that's a little bit behind auto, not that auto's super advanced in terms of like the digital retailing world, but there are other right. industries that are even behind it. Um, this is one of them. And, uh, and then, you know, getting new, new business, new conquest business. Those are going to be the two topics we talk about. It's not a full on business bourbon of cigars with all the excursions and activities and the fun stuff. Um, but they're, but they're, it's a, it was a last minute, uh, plan. So they're bringing me in to do that. And I'm excited about that. Um, 
but going to your point, right? You're talking about ask. And and that's basically what we're going to, we're not directly asking them the question, but the, the way the mastermind works, it'll uncover that just by asking them those, those simple questions. Is Another it way I think for you, is it benefiting you? What should we be correct. working on next? Correct. Um, I can't tell you, you know, a John Frazier <laughs> who just left one of the AMSI stores, he went to Houston. I don't know if you saw that. But, I did. I mean, he hired us already at that store with Justin Pomeroy. Um, yep. You want to talk about an incredible partner, John Frazier, but, but, you know, he, he embodies this, but you ask him if Bob Gower, as he's partnering with him, asks those questions and he's going to tell yeah. you, yes. If you ask him, Hey, are they always perfect? He's going to tell you, no, he's gonna say, yeah. look, they yeah. screw up, but they take care of it. They, they'll right. address it or they'll, you know, and then do they excel? Yeah. There's areas we could never execute in that they execute for us. So to me, um, when you're, when you're in the ivory tower and you're creating those ideas and you're not out there dialoguing, um, well, you think about it, John, if, if you're in the it world or, or software development world, right. And you've got your top clients in there and they're in the topic is digital retailing. You know, what's keeping you from being better at digital retailing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of that comes down to that tool, that software, right? Yeah. It, 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 of course, process will come into that as well. But sometimes the tool, you're limited on your process because you're, limit, you're, you're limited by what the capabilities are. I mean, this company is going to hear firsthand, we needed to do this. We needed to do that. I wish we could do that. I mean, it's basically going to be a wish list because I'll approach it as if anything's possible. I, I don't want to hear that. Don't talk about solutions as to what your current situation is. Part of this thing here is to develop the solution that's going to get you exactly what you want. So, um, but you know, another good way on client feedback, pay attention, really pay attention. Don't, don't pay attention to your reviews just for the sake of having a good social image and social brand. So in other words, a lot of companies, I think, pay attention to their reviews good or bad and know that they got to respond to them. And, and it's the typical canned stuff, right? Thank you for your, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Uh, we've reached out to you privately, or you could call us here, right? Cause they don't want to escalate and have the, the debate on online. And it shows other people that they're responsive, but then they never do anything with it. So your clients in your reviews, you should, you should welcome the negatives as long as you're handling them, right? as much as the positives, because they're going to tell you what you're doing well, certain reviews and what you need to build on. And then other things that are, they're telling you, you guys stink here, fix this. <laughs> and it, it just gives you a blueprint of what you can do. I mean, those negative reviews tend to be about the same things. <laughs> yeah. What's that old <laughs> axiom with customer service? It's like, you know, 80% of the people who weren't happy, not only will they not come back, but they'll tell their friends and family. That's been around right, for like right. a quarter of a century, right? That's and right. It, even though it's evolved, it hasn't really changed. Um, and, and there was a, a guy I met years ago, and I loved how he used to say this. Um, you know, he, he'd basically say, look, um, you know, if we're doing well, that's good. I want to know where we where we stink, where we are screwing up. That's what I want to know. And I just thought, wow, like how transparent is that? I remember a pastor in Houston, church we went to for over a decade. You know, he would say towards the end of service, you know, if, if you're looking for a, a perfect church, keep looking. That's what he would say. But if you're looking for a church home, you know, and I just thought, man, just that is, isn't that real? I mean, I love that. So I'll say that with our team too. Hey, if you're looking for a perfect company, keep looking, call me when you find us, so we can write the book. But in the meantime, let me tell you what we are passionate about here. Let me tell you what we are chasing here. That's real. It's approachable. And, um, and, and, and I think there's some achievement that that kind of rings true with that, that sort of outlook, if you will. Yeah. Well, that's a wrap on today's episode of Move, Crush, Count. First off, I want to extend a huge thank you to you. That's John Traver, everybody. As you could tell, if you if you watched and or are listening to this episode, I mean, you are a true student of business, um, probably of life, but definitely in self-improvement, but definitely of business. I mean, if you go to his office, if you have the opportunity, he's got a library, not a normal like couple shelves 
He's actually got a dedicated room right off of his office there that is a library to personal development, uh, business development, philosophy, strategies. That's why when he's quoting all these these people like John Maxwell and everybody else, he knows what he, he lives it. It's not show with him. Uh, I could sit here. I mean, this is this, uh, 36 minutes longer than, than we had planned. But we could let me tell you, I didn't ask half the questions. Oh my I, god. We could have kept we could have kept going, but uh I will be respectful of, of everyone's time. And but you I could talk to you all day about business. I, I because it's just so I gained so much from it. So I mean we've identified, we talked about everything from identifying challenges, uh to developing, executing about uh de- executing different growth plans. We talked about how you ask the right questions to set all that up. I mean, the whole thing. I mean, it, just a a really good show. I appreciate you helping the audience. Out I, it was my pleasure. I, I hope there's value there for those that were with us or those that watch it, you know, afterwards. And you are a, a true friend and it's fun. I mean, I, you know, this sort of evolves as you and I do these ping pongs. And my respect for you and your organization, your people is it's 10 out of 10, buddy. Keep going. I, I, need I you. appreciate it. Yep. I want the audience to do us a big favor. I want you to get to know John. And and if it's an auto, I want you to go to TraverConnect.com. Um, you owe it to yourself to check this out. And he brought up Bob Gower. I don't know if Bob would handle these calls, but I, I know Bob's always the one I go to. Listen, you're like me. I, I've got Jamil. When, when people need to get something done, I send them to Jamil. So you always send me to Bob. So I'm... <laughs> I mean, I, I'll do it, but I can't promise you what it's going to look like when it's done. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, he's I got all exactly. the levers, all he's got everything, you know? So I just work here, buddy. I just work here. That's what I do. Yeah. All right. So yep. remember, if you've enjoyed this episode, please also visit movecrushcount.com so you can catch up on all the past episodes. Subscribe so you never miss another one. Uh, you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook uh, so you can stay connected with the community and John's a, a member of our Facebook group as well. So uh, he'll be in there answering any questions you might have. Don't forget to rate us and review us. We don't pay to promote the show. It's all organic growth. So all the support means the world to us. I want to thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you next time on move crush count. Thank you. Thanks Scott. Thank you, John. <laughs>